Something that you hear a lot these days is that if you're going to have a subwoofer, you should have more than one. This multi-subs idea. And by now, actually, it's kind of a written in stone rule. However, uh, I'm not the type to blindly accept too much. I mean, there are things that are obvious that you can blindly accept. But I really like to check myself to confirm and see. And my reason for that is that people tend to overblow um, you know, the improvements that you get. See, I know that in reality, not every difference is an improvement and not every improvement is significant. And that's the reason why I want to test it out for myself. So I did that. Now here in my room, I already have a multi-sub situation. I have what amounts to four subwoofers in the front wall with two over towards the left side of the room and two over towards the right side of the room. So what I did was I individually turned those on without anything else on, and I measured the response I was getting from my listening position right here. So this first one that you see is the woofer on the left, on the bottom, alone. And you can see that it looks okay. It's a little bit lumpy, but not too bad. The next one is the subwoofer that's directly above that. You can see that there's a little bit of a suck out just above 40 hertz. And this is some SBIR. That's some cancellation from boundaries where you get a reflection back and it, it kind of cancels it. And that's a very common problem you have. And it's based on where the uh, subwoofer is located in the room. In my instance, this is an infinite baffle setup. They're mounted in the front wall of the room but there's a room behind it that the back of the driver is open into. So the back room behind this, uh, this room is like a big speaker box and the far wall, which is just four feet away, um, is a concrete wall. So you're getting a hard reflection back from that. And I would guess that that is the cause of that dip at around 42 Hertz. Now the next one that we're looking at here is the, right on the bottom and on this one you can see that the dip is around 53 54 hertz and it's actually a little bit deeper and this last one is the top woofer on the right and it's a very similar response with the same dip at around 53 hertz now like i said before that's the individual measurements of each subwoofer on their own this next plot that we're looking at is the combined response with the volume lowered so it matches the output of each individual subwoofer. And you can see that this is a lot smoother and flatter with no big dips in the response anywhere. So I thought it would be interesting to add another subwoofer into the mix, one that I can move around the room and test it from there. So the first thing I did was measure that on its own and that's what you're looking at right here. Right off the bat, you can see that the output from this one is quite a bit lower than the other ones, especially the other ones combined. But I'll still be able to use this to see if it has any impact on the overall response. So what I did was I turned on the four in the front again, and I used the mobile sub, so christened, to test it in six different locations. And I made individual measurements of those, but this plot that you're looking at here shows all six together along with the front's only measurement, which is the black trace. And we can see that it did have an effect on the output. The individual locations that I put this sub are not really important to this. You would have to test this out and actually run measurements to find the optimal location. In my case, the optimal location looks like it's that top purple trace, but everything else is pretty good as well. And you can see that there's a substantial increase below 30 Hertz, even though the smaller mobile sub that I use doesn't have a lot of output down there. And finally, this trace is an average of all six locations. And when we compare it to the fronts only, and we can see that there is a difference. The thing to take away from this is that multi-subs work. And if you don't have the measurement equipment, like a measurement mic, and want to familiarize yourself with how to do all this, you'll still get fairly good results if you just randomly place the third sub or each of the three subs, or even if you're just doing two subs. If you randomly place them, 
you'll probably get an improvement overall. Now I should also point out that I looked at the reverb time of each of these measurements and compared them with one another and also with the uh, various combinations that I did and I saw no real improvement in the decay time of the um, low frequency in the room where you're hitting uh, room node modes and whatnot. Now you might be able to achieve some kind of uh, subtle improvement with the positioning of say the mobile sub or you know moving subs around but you really need to be measuring it to find that out and um, I don't really think that the time it would take to do that would be worth it. It's worth it to measure it for the frequency response that you'll get the improvement there but as for decay time you know trying to um, offset room modes and so I don't think you're gonna do you know, I don't think you're gonna make any real improvements there or at least I didn't see any in the measurements that I took.